the importance of our shared efforts to affirm the value of each and every human life has excruciating clarity in the aftermath of evil. Our hearts break for those in Paris, in Beirut, and in other places around the world where vile acts of terror have extinguished life and assaulted our communities. Yet even in the depth of our mourning, we are not swayed from our determination to defend and preserve the very values under threat, values that are strengthened through a quality education for all children, but especially those who live in the midst of crisis and conflict. There's no one for whom this belief carries greater weight than President Obama. This morning, we are so fortunate to have with us White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough, who made it a special priority to be here today. Dennis has been a fixture of White House national security policy from day one. He has served as Deputy National Security Advisor, as Chief of Staff of the National Security Staff, and as the Deputy, Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications. But as I think many of you know, it's not his staff positions that have set Dennis apart. It is the strength of his character. I've been honored to know Dennis for some time now, and there is not a day when I have not seen him fight with all his might and all his heart for a world of greater compassion, security, and human dignity. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough. Well, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you, Heather, for that very, very uh, overly generous introduction. Uh, Heather and I have been through uh, a lot of uh, great fights together, and uh, we just spent uh, the afternoon on Friday in the Situation Room working on Syrian refugees, uh, an effort that uh, would ha we've uh, continued to make um, hard-earned gains on, uh, particularly because of Heather's uh, excellent work. I, too, want to thank uh, Tony uh, for the great work that he's doing on this. Tony emailed me last week as soon as he got the call to head to the Philippines to ask if I could uh, come over, given how much he has invested in this effort working with each of you. And I was uh, only too glad to do so, having heard uh, both in Tony's voice and seen in his writing in the email how strongly he feels about this. So. Uh, I thank uh, each of you as well for push, putting your shoulder to this in, incredibly important wheel uh, as we continue to face, uh, as Heather said, the uh, aftermath of evil in all of its manifestations here regarding the situation in Syria. As the President said on Friday night, the as the terrible attacks in Paris were unfolding and then reiterated yesterday at the G20 in Turkey, the attacks in Paris were an attack on all of humanity and the universal values that we share. Fitting then that we're gathered here in the Franklin Room. Ben Franklin is known as our country's first diplomat, serving initially in Paris from 1776 to 1778 to engender what ultimately be, uh, became the critical French support for our independence. And then having presented his credentials to the French court in 1779, becoming President Washington's and the independent United States first ambassador to France. So France has had our back, as it were, since day one. And I can say on behalf of the president that uh, France has every right to expect that we will have its back today. Vive la France. So today, as this group of leaders, each of you from government, from tech companies, from other companies, from nonprofits and foundations, come together to explore how we provide the 400,000 school-aged children in Turkey access to education, you too are putting your shoulder to this very important wheel. Think about that yourselves as you've sent your kids off to school this morning. 400,000 kids in Turkey don't have that access. It's an issue of great importance to the President, and it was on the agenda today at the G20 in Turkey. And just about an hour, we'll hear from the President about our redoubled determination to deepen cooperation 
and destroy with France and with others to destroy ISIL, whose treachery obviously knows no bounds. And while the United States and our global coalition does just that, this group has a critical role to play as well. We have to ensure that we do not allow ISIL to steal the futures of these 400,000 kids who have already had part of their childhood stolen as they're forced to flee from their homes and from their school classrooms due to violence from ISIL and from the Assad regime. Your work won't be easy, but it's worth it because those kids, those kids are a serious future. Not ISIL, not Assad, but those kids. And the talent that's gathered in this room has done even harder things in the past. So we have every confidence that your session today will take the next step in meeting this challenge. And I can assure you that you will continue to have a partner in this State Department and this White House in this effort. We will do our part on this, even as we do our part on addressing the historic refugee challenge facing the United States and the world around the globe, including from Syria. Since the days of Franklin, this country has been the refuge for the world's tired, poor, huddled masses yearning to be free. It's part of who we are. It's what we do. And President Obama, irrespective of the political winds in Washington, will not let ISIL change that in us. Many of the individuals and families who have fled Syria are flee fleeing precisely the type of violence and brutality that occurred in Paris on Friday night. Just as it has throughout our history, it continues to serve both our interest and our values to assist and provide safe haven to refugees and other vulnerable populations fleeing conflict. These people have much to contribute to this nation, to the world, and to the community of nations. Closing our doors and turning a blind eye to populations who continue to be in great need is not the answer. We don't have to choose one set of interests at the expense of another here. We will work with our friends to manage the global migrant and humanitarian crisis, just as we will provide our partners in Europe support to enhance border controls, security vetting, and information sharing, and to fulfill our traditional American role of continuing to provide refuge, we will continue to implement the security screening and vetting processes that have been significantly enhanced over the past years, thanks to the work of Heather and others. All refugees will continue to be subject to security and background checks based on the latest technology and relying on the resources of this building, the National Counterterrorism Center, the FBI's Terrorist Screening Center, and the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. Together we will continue to meet these challenges and working with you we will meet the challenge of educating Syrian children seeking refugee, refuge in Turkey. And we will continue our work to destroy ISIL as we work with our partners to facilitate political transition in Syria. As we are determined and committed, we will reap the benefits of these investments in the future in Syria and in the broader region. So you have a heavy task, an important task today. I thank you for taking it on, and I wish you only luck and our continued support as you do so. I thank you very much. Heather, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dennis. I'd like to invite everyone to take a seat. We have a few speakers, and uh, we need you to make all your, keep all of your energy and focus uh, for the hard work we have ahead of us. So please. <clears throat> Great, thank you. When we were planning today's event, we wanted to make sure that it would take place in this very room. As Dennis said, this is the Ben Franklin Room, named after our nation's first diplomat and one of the most brilliant scientific and literary minds in American history. Ben Franklin charted the Gulf Stream. He pioneered the study of electricity, and he helped forge a new ethos of self-government that shaped our young nation. In other words, he was a problem solver, one of our histories, one of our nation's greatest. There wasn't a flash of lightning or a gust of wind or even a drop of liquor that didn't pique his intense curiosity. He looked at problems in new ways, not as difficulties over which to, to despair, 
but as challenges to be solved. And today, I can't imagine a setting more fitting or a spirit more apt to inspire and strengthen the sense of purpose for which we come together. A little over a year ago, I visited a refugee camp near Adana, and I met families who'd lost their homes, children who'd lost their parents, and parents who had lost sons and daughters. I met only a few dozen people that day, but we know there are 16 million people like them who have been affected by the tragedy of the Syrian crisis. As you'll hear this morning, seven million of them are children, a number almost too difficult to fathom. But these are not just numbers. These are children clinging to stuffed animals whose entire worlds have been crammed into small backpacks hanging from their weary shoulders. These are women who have seen their bombs destroy their neighborhoods and felt hunger eat away at their courage. These are men anxious to find safety, a good job, and new beginnings for their families against all odds, forced to flee their homes. These families hope beyond hope they will find safe places to start over. Thanks in great part to your organizations, many of them have found shelter and a safe place. Since the beginning of this crisis, the United States has worked with our partners in this room and across the region to provide over $4.5 billion in humanitarian assistance to help address dire conditions, expand access to education, and strengthen the resilience of host communities in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan that have so generously opened their, do their doors to those in need. We are incredibly grateful to our friends and partners in Turkey for the leadership and compassion that they have shown in hosting more than two million refugees from Syria and thousands of others from around the world. An example to nations, Turkey has committed itself to providing formal education for children and enshrining this as a right in its laws on the temporary protection of Syrians, recognizing that the task of finding classroom spaces for hundreds of thousands of children is enormous. Turkey is looking to us here today and the organizations that you represent to help bridge this gap. This is, I have to say, a little bit of an unusual event for us. In most cases, we host discussions or conferences where we ask our participants simply to listen instead of problem solve, but not today. Today, we are honored to hear from distinguished speakers who have traveled great distances to help set the stage for this morning's conversation. We'll hear lightning talks, from two experts who will speak with specificity to the details of the challenges that we must address. And then we'll break into a reception for an informal discussion on the ideas and partnerships we have in mind. To begin this morning, I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Ali Ozturk, advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister with responsibility for managing the Syrian crisis response, Dr. Anthony Lake, the Executive Director of UNICEF, and Megan Stone, President of the Malala Fund. Dr. Ostark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you so much for uh, inviting us with, with this, for this very important and very serious topic today. And thank you so much, Mr. Mrs. Uh, Higginbottom, about this great introduction and great talk as a start. And I would like to also convey the same uh, similar condemnations like um, our President and Prime Minister uh, saying that we are all, always with the French people about their uh, latest uh, undesirable event and terrorist attack and hopefully it's not going to be repeated any, any time soon. Today's topic again is very serious about the post-conflict era, especially with the new generation of Syrian children. Syrian population, cause it's uh, education, and education is a very sensitive and a very critical issue in terms of uh, new generations in coming, uh, coming years and so. Closing the gap, uh, education gap in Turkey is not a Turkish issue, of course, it's about Syrian children's future. So distinguished government representatives, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, since the outset of the conflict in March 2011, Increasing number of, number of Syrians have been running away from death and destruction in their home country, looking for a shelter, safe shelters to arrive and also survive. With its 
historical, cultural, and neighborhood ties, Turkey has followed open door policy since then. Today, more than 2.2 million Syrians live in Turkey. That number is unfortunately increasing day by day. The right to education is among the fundamental human rights. Being aware of this reality, Turkey has developed various policies to meet the educational needs of Syrian children and youngsters. In Turkey, the Minister of National Education is responsible for ensuring that everyone benefit from educational services. And specifically for foreign students, educational services are carried by the ministry itself and also provincial committees around the country. The ministry has been conducting its education services for Syrians who are under temporary protection studies using two main approaches. The first one is to ensure that Syrians living in all around the country, not only camps, cities, except only nine exceptions of the cities, other uh, almost 72 cities all around the country that are scattered around Syrian children. So Turkey pretty uh, much using all the capacity, allowing access to the education services along with other Turkish students. And by integrating them into the system, what we have offering our own children in Turkey. The second approach is to ensure that Syrians can access the educational services through a special program. The special program for them for, with their own languages. The reason is that they learn their own languages so they will be ready for their, when they return their home, they will be continuing their own education and their edu educational path. With the latest circular, temporary education centers are being established wherever necessary based on density of Syrian children's population in, throughout Turkey. As these centers, at, at these centers, Turkish teachers teach Turkish language to adapt them to the Turkish system. Also, they, they also volunteer Syrian teachers teaching their own languages, preventing them, lagging behind their usual classes, and also let them continue their education at the same time they learn Turkish, and they will be able to incorporate the Turkish system seamlessly. Dear colleagues, it is anticipated that Turkey, in Turkey right now, around 650,000 school-age Syrians. 650,000, that is enormous number. It's, this number is more than many uh, countries hosting refugees around the world. Only 250,000 Syrian children are reached educational services throughout the system, either in, at, at camps, temporary protection centers, or in the cities. Now we are talking about around 400,000 Syrian children. So they need formal education, and also rest of the population about the, for their families as well. Their families need extra support because they are really in need, in daily, daily needs and daily uh, life circumstances. So for, as Turkish government, we have listed several uh, issues that we have to be for, for sure, in coming years, we have to solve the issue to serve other 400,000 400, Syrian students in Turkey. And the one, num, number one is that increasing the capacity of central and provincial organization of ministry, conducting support works for school managers and teachers, because already Turkey is very young for population. Our extreme needs in educational system is every year is demanding more and more resources. Informing Syrian families about for about opportunities for access to education and raising awareness. That's another issue. Because even though we have all the resources available for them, many families, sometimes they don't want to send their kids, sometimes they don't know where to send. So that's another issue to come up. Cash transfer for the families of Syrian children who are in need. Yes, some families are willing to send their kids, but they don't have enough cash or enough financial ability to send their kids to buying books, buying other necessary school staff. Building new schools and allocating them as temporary education centers. Temporary education centers throughout the country, again, based on density of Syrian children are built. And now they have to be enriched and also new buildings and also new accommodation centers has to be, temporary education centers has to be built. 
allocating school buildings for Syrian students on part-time basis. This is about already uh, used by Turkish students daily daytime and afternoons or the, after regular times, Syrian kids, Syrian children can use the same buildings to save and uh, save cost and also use efficient, efficiently using all our resources. Employing additional education personnel, paid teachers and volunteer Syrian teachers. This is another issue. Providing and distrib distrib distributing educational materials and stationery for students is especially important for border cities, where density is pretty high in terms of Syrian kids. And lastly, we have to monitor, we have to report, and we have to certificate their work. That's another and maybe the last and very important topic. In addition to K-12 education services, higher education opportunities for Syrian students who completed their secondary education in Turkey has also can have a chance to uh, attend higher education in universities, public and private universities. Our Higher Education Council in Turkey and also Presidency for Turks Abroad and Related Communities Authority provides scholarship and other necessities for uh, these uh, high schoolers, uh, high school graduates for Syrian students to attend public and private universities in tur throughout Turkey. And right now, the number is around 5.5 thousand students attending Turkish universities, Syrian students. And we, we are very, very uh, keen on this issue because we know that post-conflict era, new Syria will be built by those new generations. So their attendance to Turkish higher education institutions and universities are critical for us as well. And ladies and gentlemen, refugee problem is the common problem of humanity and the only solution is to produce a common solution where everybody assumes responsibility just by realizing that anyone can become a refugee one day. Turkish government has prioritized humanitarian diplomacy under all circumstances and did not ignore tragedy occurring in the closed geography. We continue to offer assistance to all Syrian guests at large scale in a way compatible with human dignity. Our hope and expectation is that the conflict in Syria is politically solved in a peaceful manner. And people that have sought refuge in other countries, including Turkey, return their, their home countries safely. I wish that following panels this morning will provide new ideas and improve access to learning for school aid children. And I would like to thank you, all the organizers and all the government, distinguished government representatives here public, private, and non-profit organizations representatives here and their contributions. Thank you so much, and I would like to express my best regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, for inviting me and uh, having me here, and uh, thank you, Heather, Heather for your um, wonderful remarks at the beginning, uh, and the reminder that we are not only talking about numbers, uh, but we are talking about human beings, about children, uh, about their futures. Uh, I, let me begin with an apology also. I'm afraid I have to catch an airplane, uh, so I will not be able to stay for the full event, uh, and I wish I were not hearing the part in which I'm talking, uh, because I would love so much to be hearing uh, from all of you. Uh, but I am very happy to be here because we're discussing an issue that really doesn't get enough attention, uh, and that's the issue of finding new ways to help all of the Syrian children living in Turkey. Needs like protection to keep them from harm, education to prepare their minds and counseling and psychosocial support to heal their hearts. And to discuss the needs in a nation that has done so much and continues to do so much for these children. Because the effects of the Syrian crisis are not Syria's alone, of course. The conflict is defined in important measure by huge displacement, the largest displacement of people since World War II. The displacement of four million Syrians, 80% of whom now live not 
in refugee camps, but in the communities in host countries like Turkey. This influx not only changes the demographic balance in the host countries, it heightens tensions, it risks increased competition for limited land and water and housing and jobs, and it forces host governments to balance the needs of the newcomers with the demands of a sometimes skeptical public. The horror in Paris is only likely to increase the burden of refugees on the nations surrounding Syria. While the plight of Syrian children living in Jordan in the Zatari camp uh, or in the Bekaa Valley and elsewhere in Lebanon is relatively well known and generates a great deal of global attention, Turkey is actually shouldering the greatest weight, with half of all Syrian refugees, over two million, now living in Turkey. A million kids, because half of them are children. A million futures in jeopardy. The future of a region being held in the hands of those children. To these children, the Turkish people have generously opened their doors and their hearts. They demonstrated their traditional hospitality and gone to extraordinary lengths to help prepare these young Syrians for the future. From opening the doors of their schools to investing in initiatives to track Syrian students' grades and attendance, to providing them with school graduation certificate. Not to mention the 2,700 2700 young Syrians who've made their way to university in Turkey this year. Turkey understands that today's children are tomorrow's doctors and engineers and teachers and lawyers, tomorrow's leaders, tomorrow's citizens armed with the skills to return one day to Syria to reconcile and to rebuild and to be the voices of peace in a region that knows far too little. But only if they have the opportunity and the skills and the desire to do so. As the conflict rages into its fifth year, the needs are overwhelming. Almost $120 million is needed for 2016 alone to maintain, just to maintain the more than 200,000 Syrian children already in school in Turkey and to close the gap for those 400,000 who are not getting an education at all. And let me emphasize that means that they do not have the skills to return to Syria and to rebuild their country. At September's UN General Assembly, Prime Minister Duvudolo made an ambitious commitment to double the number, double the number of Syrian children attending school by next June. But even that generous pledge, that ambitious goal, won't be enough to meet the need. Turkey cannot shoulder the burden alone. No one agency, no one group, no one government or business can close this gap by itself. This is not solely a matter of funding. We also need innovative ideas to reach those children that are still being left behind. Ideas like the one I saw in Jordan just last week, the Orange Foundation's digital school program, which provides free educational content to Syrian students through tablets and video equipment. After being used in 130 schools in Africa, Orange is now delivering these digital, digital school kits to five UNICEF-supported learning centers in Jordan to help Syrian children there get the ch education that they need. This is not only an, ex <coughs> excuse me, an excellent example of how the private sector can help us reach those children still being left behind. It's a reminder that we all have a responsibility to do so. Because as the conflict endures, as the needs multiply, at particular risk is a lost generation of children. Which is why two years ago, a group of partners came together to launch the No Lost Generation Initiative to provide education, protection, and healing to children inside Syria and in host countries. I know that Dennis and Heather and Ann Richards and Tony Blinken are so many others here in this building are personally committed to this cause that we give these children new hope to return home with the ability and the desire to lend their hands and their hearts to rebuilding Syria. Today's meeting is a chance for you to lend your hands and your hearts to this task. 
We need your specific, practical, practical ideas on how the private sector can play an ever greater role in reaching these children with the education, healing, and protection that they so desperately need. While I won't be able to stay for the lightning talks and the networking reception, I look forward to hearing from my UNICEF colleagues here the results of today's meeting and the ideas that you are considering. The great determination, and you see it all the time if you travel in that area, the huge determination of Syrian children to get an education and the great hospitality of the Turkish people must not go unanswered. They must be matched with new ideas, new funding, and new approaches to reach those millions of children still being left behind. So we can give a generation of Syrian children a chance at a better future, not only for themselves, but for the nation that they love. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much to our hosts for this important gathering today. I work for a very proud Pakistani Pashtun family, and they have taught us all very well at the Malala Fund that it's important to start with hospitality and honor. So I want to say thank you to the State Department for welcoming young and emerging leaders, especially women and Muslim women like Malala, to this discussion and the Malala Fund. We know this room is full of organizations and leaders who have done this work for years, if not decades. So we're standing on the shoulders of giants just by being able to speak today. Thank you. You've been on the ground since the start of this crisis. You've met needs when the world wouldn't even donate or pay attention. Thank you for your sacrifices. Thank you for the sacrifices of your field staff who Malala and our team has seen in the field tirelessly putting themselves in harm's way to feed, educate, and secure the safety of millions of Syrian refugee children. Thank you. We must also say thank you for the generosity of the U.S. government in meeting this emergency. You continue to be a leading donor. You've given over $4.5 billion in life-saving humanitarian funding for the people and children impacted by this crisis in Syria. So often as advocates, we are so focused on the problem and the great need, we don't stop and say thank you to those who are bringing solutions. So I want to say we're grateful for your leadership in meeting this crisis. I was struck recently by the title of an excellent but really chilling report by Human Rights Watch on what's happening with Syrian refugee education. The title is actually a quote from a girl who's 16, and she says, when I picture my future, I see nothing. I see nothing. In the face of that kind of desperation, the global community cannot do nothing. We are here, us, today. We cannot do nothing. In the report, we also hear from Shaza Bakrat. She's a mother, but she's also the director of a Syrian temporary education center in Istanbul. And she says there, if a person is sick, they can get treatment and they can get better. If a child doesn't go to school, it will create big problems in the future. They will end up on the streets, they will go back to Syria, they will die fighting, or they will be radicalized into extremists, or they will die in the ocean trying to get to Europe. This is all too real for her because her own son died at the age of 16 in 2012 when he returned to Syria to fight with opposition forces after he found no educational opportunity in Turkey. Today is about bridging the gap in education for Syrian refugees, particularly in Turkey. But the only way we can bridge this gap is if we decide today to stand in that gap. If Malala was here today with us, instead of her own safe modern school, she would remind us that standing in the gap requires commitment. And commitment only counts if it's kept. As we meet today to consider what all of us will commit to help address this crisis, I want to share that Malala has a personal commitment to offer. We at the Malala Fund probably have the youngest boss in the room. She's an 18-year-old young woman and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and she's our leader and our co-founder. But what many miss about her story is that she herself has been a refugee. She was an internally displaced person in her own country, a refugee in her own nation. She knows what it feels like to go from place to place with an uncertain future, missing that safe school, that safe home, wanting to go back to that safety you once knew. So to her, this is very personal. 
Even this past summer, she chose to spend her 18th birthday in Lebanon on the border of Syria, opening a school in the Becca Valley for refugee girls and calling that day on world leaders to donate to the urgent and still unmet UN appeal for Syrian relief. So she commits this year to making the fight for education of refugee children from Syria the most important part of her personal activism. We know that half of Syria's refugees are children, and that 65% of these children living in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon are out of school. Every year they miss will cost them dearly in lost opportunities for themselves and for their families. Malala, a high school student herself, reminds us every day that we cannot afford to lose a whole generation like this. We must get these children to a place where they can learn safely, so their talent, their potential, their gifts to the world are not lost for good. In September, Malala spoke at the UN General Assembly, asking the world to invest in books, not bullets. She invited girls from around the world to stand with her and tell their stories, and one of them was a young woman, Salam who was a Syrian refugee living in Lebanon. A journalist asked her after the speech what was the one thing she wanted world leaders to know. She said refugee children need to go back to school because we are the ones who will rebuild our country. We all know Salam and her Syrian sisters and brothers cannot do that with three years of education, which is what most poor children receive. While we continue to hope for a diplomatic end to the Syrian crisis, we have to prepare for the future, giving all Syrian refugee girls access to a full 12 years of quality, free, and safe education is absolutely imperative to their future and to our own. To date, the Malala Fund has given more than a million dollars in grants to local partners who are helping adolescent Syrian refugee girls in Jordan and Lebanon to go to school. We hope to double that in the coming year, and in 2016, we commit to stepping up that support to include programs in Turkey. We are a small organization compared to most of the partners in this room today, so we are not going to help every Syrian refugee girl on our own. So Malala is calling on governments around the world to join us and you in supporting these children and to work with the government of Turkey to provide funding for education. Earlier this year, Turkey asked the world for $59 million for education for Syrian refugees. They received only $13 million. To all of us, that has to say that the world is not serious yet on meeting this problem. Turkey has made the commitment to lead and to integrate refugee children into their education system, so we have to help them get every remaining student back into school now. I want to close with this. We've all seen the devastating news coverage the last few days. It impacted Malala personally. She stands in solidarity with the victims and families of those who have been impacted in Lebanon, in Paris, in Egypt. She knows all too well what it means to be a victim of violent extremism. She knows the causes and answers are not as simple as a headline. She knows that her faith calls her and the world to peace and reconciliation. There was one report this weekend that really stayed with me personally. Someone said that this is a clash of civilizations. Is it? I want to ask this room, if it is, what will we be known by? It is not a clash. It is an opportunity to show the best of both the West and the East and what we all know to be true, that the generosity and humanitarian principles and education are our most powerful weapons to change circumstances, futures, and entire nations. Crisis has a way of revealing the truth of who we are and what we believe. So today, let us decide to be known by the power and the generosity of our commitments.